So we are going to start to go through uh, part four uh, of this book. And um, it uh, deals with uh, applications of the, uh, the methods um, that have been taught in the class. So first up is uh, a set of examples of how we incorporate environmental parameters into models and how we can change environments, uh, the inputs into a model, and compute <coughs> how an organism uh, or a network is likely to respond to those changes. So <coughs> we're going to go through this at a pretty high level. The first thing we're going to talk about is uh, varying a single parameter. That's the easiest thing to uh, look at. And often uh, when we grow cells, we can actually manipulate a single parameter, and we can then calculate the consequences of that, if you like. We can also uh, look at um, how we vary uh, two parameters at the same time and get a little bit of a broader view of the properties of, uh, of a model that we have constructed. And uh, today we are not going to talk much about the underlying methods, but maybe more uh, how these methods work conceptually and some um, of their applications. Okay, so for some uh, reason, actually a historical reason, the variation of one parameter uh, in a model, environmental param parameter in a model, has been called robustness analysis. So here is the concept. We have an objective function, and we're going to keep using the growth rate through all these slides as our objective, as a function of a parameter. In this case, the oxygen availability to an organism. And that tends to be uh, the most significant uh, environmental variable, as I think most of you know. Uh, just turns out the choice or the availability, I should say, of an electron acceptor is so important to the metabolic uh, state of any organism. Okay, so the idea here, uh, kind of fundamentally, is to just uh, parameterize, um, uh, or I should say, increment one of these parameters and in a computer in a way you just run a do loop and you keep changing that parameter and you and you do the optimization over and over and over again and you just trace out the value of the objective function across a finite distance <coughs> of numerical uh, finite range of numerical values of that parameter and you may trace out a curve like this and <coughs> the curve shown there has a single optimum <coughs> that would be predictive of the optimal oxygen uptake rate of an organism now, uh, as we know, the shadow prices are the sensitivity of the objective function with respect to um, uh, um, the, uh, basically a boundary flux. And here we are directly varying a boundary flux. So the slope of that curve is simply the derivative of the objective function with respect to that boundary flux. And as it's a little hard to see in here, uh, but possible, you see that the curve is piecewise linear. So there are ranges uh, of numerical values of the optic rate in this case, where the shadow price is always the same. Then all of a sudden there's a kink in the curve, and that shadow price changes, and the slope changes. And that's something that's going to uh, become important here in a, in a moment. So let's go through some of these calculations, maybe the historical ones first. Um, again, oxygen optic rate has been of great interest, um, uh, and this is... Uh, uh, based on um, kind of a fermentation application. So here we have a cell, has substrate, uh, glucose as indicated, then oxygen coming in with a squiggly line. And then it can grow <coughs> um, it, uh, uh, and secrete the metabolic byproducts. So normally what happens is that when oxygen becomes limiting, you get a mixture of aerobic and anaerobic growth. So some fermentation products are secreted because oxygen, uh, because glucose cannot be fully oxidized. And this is kind of an operating diagram uh, that you might see uh, in bioprocessing, where on the x-axis is the ability of uh, the fermenter uh, to deliver uh, oxygen into solution. This is normally a function of the stirring speed, uh, the shape of the uh, fermenter, and so forth. And on the y-axis here is the consumption, the oxygen consumption rate. And that is normally just a product of the specific oxygen optic rate, you know, the per cell oxygen optic rate, times the number of viable cells. And of course, as something grows in a fermenter, the number of viable cells goes uh, up. But normally, the oxygen delivery capacity is a constant. You fix uh, the stirring speed and whatnot. 
So that arrow that goes up uh, <coughs> uh, vertically indicates uh, growth. So you may start out where there is plenty of oxygen because there is so little biomass, but as biomass grows uh, or is formed, the cells grow, you eventually cross that 45 degree line where the oxygen consumption rate uh, wants to exceed what is being supplied. And then it, uh, the cells have insufficient oxygen and they will secrete fermentation byproducts. So there's been a lot of interest in predicting these byproducts, um, both by type and by rate. And it turns out the uh, uh, constraints-based models will actually predict both. So what this uh, panel here shows uh, on the top is the growth rate of um, uh, the coli model, an old version of it, as a function of the oxygen optic rate. So if it's zero, you know, uh, if, if you're at the zero on the x-axis, it's fully anaerobic growth, and then you can increase the oxygen concentration to a value where they don't take up anymore. And when you do this calculation, you fix all the other uh, inputs. And what's shown in the lower panel are the predicted um, metabolic byproduct secretion rates. So um, numerically in this case, uh, 20 on the x-axis, 20 units of oxygen coming in, uh, is, allows full uh, oxidation of glucose, so no byproducts come out. So as we drop the oxygen uh, availability below 20 in these units, the byproducts start coming out. And um, let's see. And in this case, <clears throat> we predict the secretion rates, and they're shown there. Uh, acetate comes out first, and then the dashed line is formate coming out, and then there's a final kick where ethanol starts coming out. So those are predictions, and the slope of these curves, uh, uh, or the absolute value of these curves, uh, well, the slope of the curve tells you how, uh, gives you an indication of what the secretion rate of that uh, metabolic byproduct is. That little red box it highlights um, uh, secretion rate, fermentation product secretion rate by E. coli under fully um, um, anaerobic conditions. And there is, uh, in that table, there are both uh, the predicted rates and the measured rates, and they agree surprisingly well. Uh, this particular strain of E. coli used here um, um, uh, secreted a little succinate, which the model will not do. Uh, this, the small uh, E. coli model will not do. So this is uh, a historical um, uh, an example. This was published in 1993, as it says to the top there of the slide, to the top left. And this was one of the early predictions of uh, metabolic output from a cell. And it was surprising that the relatively simple stoichiometric model of the uh, overall um, energy yielding pathways in a cell could do this. They could predict not only the rate correctly, but also the type of uh, 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 metabolic byproducts secreted. And it turns out that you can use shadow prices to predict uh, which metabolic byproduct should be secreted. So what I should have pointed out on, on the previous slide is that there were a few kinks in the curve and there are five distinct growth phases uh, in that curve. You vary the uh, oxygen optic rate continuously, but there are only five discrete states in there, which is kind of interesting. So if you look at the flux map in phase one, it is uh, shown here, fragmented use of the TCA cycle uh, by metabolic byproduct coming out, three of them, acetate, formate, and ethanol, as I indicated. And it turns out that the shadow price in the solution for these three uh, metabolites is zero, meaning they're useless to the cell with respect to increasing growth rate. And therefore, they are predicted to be secreted, where all the other metabolites have a shadow price uh, uh, that is finite and the cell would like more of them. So that's the prediction as to why these three uh, compounds would be secreted under fully anaerobic conditions. So here is um, uh, phase two, or so the graph of phase one is not just fully anaerobic conditions, but up to the first kink in the curve. At the first kink in the curve, we move into phase two, which is a different metabolic state, and in this case, the shadow price for ethanol is no longer zero. So ethanol now has value to the cell, and the prediction is it should not be secreted. 
So under these um, oxygen conditions, um, past phase one, uh, the model would predict that only formate and acetate be secreted. And then finally, if you move into the fourth phase, which is the second to last, uh, we've throttled, we've increased the uh, uh, oxygen input, and in this phase, only acetate has a negative shadow price. And that's the only one that's predicted to be uh, secreted. And then when there is sufficient uh, uh, um, uh, oxygen available, um, uh, its shadow price goes to zero because it can't use any more oxygen. So the shadow prices have been used to uh, predict these optimal solutions. And they, um, in this case, predict accurately uh, not only the secretion order of these uh, metabolic byproducts as oxygen goes down, but also their uh, secretion rates uh, quantitatively. So that um, is surprising, uh, or was surprising. Um, and these kind of calculation studies have been repeated for a number of different bacteria uh, by different labs. So the um, uh, summary points here are that optimality principles, in this case growth, um, can predict the overall phenotypic states. And there's a discrete number of them. There is a shift predicted between uh, different phenotypic states. And uh, you can interpret the solution here based on shadow prices directly. And it basically becomes an econometric type interpretation of what has value to a cell and what doesn't. And so the cell doesn't let anything go that has, uh, has value to it. Okay, so um, in the uh, core E. coli model that you're using, uh, you can um, perform similar calculations. I should say with the current E. coli core model, uh, you can carry out similar uh, calcu uh, calculations. So for instance, we can go and look at the ATP production rates that we calculated a couple of lectures ago. Um, uh, we calculated the optimal ATP yield with oxygen and without oxygen. Now it turns out those are endpoints on a continuous curve that we can actually uh, compute. And uh, we can compute um, the uh, ATP yield on glucose as a function of oxygen availability. And if you do that, you trace on the curve that looks something similar to what we had before. At the extremes of it are the numbers that we uh, computed before when you have enough oxygen. Uh, 17 and a half ATPs are uh, produced per mole of glucose. And at the other end, you have 2.75 uh, moles of ATP made per uh, uh, mole of glucose consumed. And there are uh, three phases in here. But notice if you go past exactly six, I mean, there are exactly six oxygen. If you look at the, the, the uh, chemical equation for full uh, 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 oxidation of glucose, you take one glucose molecule plus six uh, oxygen molecules, it gives you six CO2 cents of water. Uh, in this case, if you go past six, you can't balance the equations anymore because you're force feeding it oxygen and it doesn't know what to do with it and you can't find the solution. So there's a cliff on that curve right at six. Okay, and you can, for each one of these solutions, you can uh, look at the byproduct secretion rates, and the blue curve there is acetate, and the green one uh, is formate, and the red one is ethanol. So you have the same byproducts being secreted here as for the growth solution. Uh, we can look at this in more detail. Uh, so here are the flux maps. So let me just put these two panels up here that we, we're just looking at. So these uh, flux maps are for oxygen uptake of a half, which is in the middle of the first phase, one and a half, which is in the middle of the second phase, and four at the bottom, that's in the middle of the uh, third phase in there. And you see in that third phase, that's the flux map at the bottom, the TCA cycle is being used, and um, so is the uh, electron transport chain, and, um, but there's a little bit of metabolic byproduct being secreted in the form of acetate. If you look at the first phase where um, the oxygen uptake rate is a half, there is no use of the TCA cycle. And you see three red uh, lines going out, which correspond to the three uh, fermentation products. So here is the calculation for growth on glucose, extended a little bit. You know, you see these phases as uh, 
uh, growth rate, the objective uh, increases as a function of oxygen uptake, but then it starts going down as you force feed it. You're forcing it to grow oxygen, and if you force it to grow, you know, uh, import enough oxygen, it can eventually drive that to zero. Of course, a cell would never pick up more oxygen than it needs. So that phase past the uh, optimum is predicted to be phenotypically unstable. In other words, if you would start with an oxygen uptake rate in there, the cell would actually reduce the oxygen uptake rate to get a higher growth rate. But you can compute it. Okay, so those are how you can get base uh, uh, solutions. Um, um, you can get, a, uh, uh, I should say, a baseline of how the uh, objective changes with a single parameter. But then you can do uh, sensitivity analysis and start looking at how other parameters affect that uh, um, uh, uh, optimum. And we'll just in a moment formally talk about how we continuously vary a, another parameter. So the panel here furthest to the left uh, shows the uh, use of the pentose pathway. Uh, which is the, what's calculated on the x-axis. And you can see three curves, the red, green, and re uh, red, uh, green, and blue, that hit a maximum and then go down. And right at that maximum is the predicted uh, use of the uh, pentose pathway shunt. Higher or lower use would predict a, a worse growth rate. So it predicts the split between the pentose pathway and glycolysis here. But you see that curve, that optimum can move back and forth. And in this case, um, Biomass was forced to be produced, but if you increase the, uh, uh, in this case, a, 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 a maintenance function was added. So as you start siphoning some of the ATP up for maintenance, in addition to using, using it for growth, you predict the differential use of the pentose pathway, and that's what's shown there. Um, um, the um, uh, middle panel actually shows the growth rate. Uh, uh, as a function of, uh, <coughs> or actually it's the biomass yield in this case, as, uh, as it plotted against the uh, ATP maintenance requirement. And that maintenance requirement there is driven all the way up to 17 and a half, uh, you know, ATPs where all of glucose consumed. And then, of course, no growth is uh, achievable. So this graph there is a direct trade-off between growth uh, and maintenance. So you can calculate things like that. And the panel furthest to the right uh, shows the uh, effect of the PO ratio uh, on the biomass yield, which is substantial. So when you do um, sensitivity calculations like this on, on simple models, you always find out that the PO ratio is the dominant parameter. And that's unfor unfortunately the one that's often hardest to uh, uh, compute correctly because reconstructing member membrane-based processes is difficult, as we talked about. So some examples from the literature, some examples of how this is used. Um, here is one of the first calculations done where uh, um, an optimal solution was computed. And then one of the internal fluxes, the optimal solution for that internal flux was taken and then forced to go up and down. And you see uh, as it goes down, uh, the the uh, uh, curve is flat for many of the fluxes because you can actually change that internal flux a lot without changing the optimum. Probably, you know, zero reduced cost for that internal flux. But as you throttle it down to a certain critical value, all of a sudden that reaction uh, is in the critical path to generating biomass. And it just goes linearly down to zero. So the more you uh, throttle down that reaction, uh, the less biomass you can produce. But above that value, it doesn't care. The reaction is at a high enough flux. And that little insert shows that if you force these fluxes to be too high, that also drives uh, the uh, uh, um, growth rate down. And as we see in a moment, uh, uh, these kind of computations can be used to calibrate the expression level of a heterologous gene uh, that you're trying to express and not affect the growth rate. OK. Um, so here is another calculation that uh, we've actually shown before. Let me see, getting ahead of myself here. Where we were calculating uh, the proton secretion rate, which is shown here on the x-axis as a function of the growth rate that we uh, force uh, in this case. 
and uh, we can predict the proton secretion uh, rate. And uh, as we've shown in a previous lecture, uh, these predictions uh, turn out to be uh, accurate. So here are uh, some more cases. The first one um, I'm putting up again, panel A, that I just mentioned before. Because these curves, when they start going down to zero like that, then hit zero, these can be good drug targets. Because the more you throttle down the flux to, uh, uh, through that uh, reaction, the lower the growth rate is. And on the, in panel B, um, there's a calculation shown there for a particular pathogen and the flux through the ATP synthase, which is a target uh, of a drug. And so you can see you know, how much you can try to estimate how much drug you need uh, to get a significant phenotypic effect. The two panels on the bottom show how this sort of analysis has been used to uh, calibrate the expression of a heterologous gene in a metabolic engineering design. This comes from Sang Yap Lee at uh, uh, Kaisten, Korea, where they realized when they overexpressed a the gene, they were actually past that optimum, and they uh, uh, tuned the uh, promoter, um, the strength of the promoter to hit that optimum, uh, and that was kind of verified by the, that expression profiling data shown in panel D. Uh, so that they could calibrate the right expression level of that enzyme so you wouldn't disturb the rest of the cell. So these are examples of how you would uh, uh, compute phenotypic responses as a function of a single environmental uh, parameter and uh, some examples of uh, the utility of such calculations. Now, we can compute um, um, this the same things for more than one parameter simultaneously, as we'll uh, talk about now. And we generate something that's called a phenotypic phase plane. And this is an interesting name. This name comes from the PVT diagrams you see in uh, PCAM, where you fix temperature, pressure, and volume, and you calculate the phase that a substance is predicted to be in. So solid, liquid, or gas. Remember those? Those were called, uh, these are phase planes. To to compute what the phase is and to compute them in chemistry, you minimize Gibbs free energy under those conditions and you predict what the uh, state of the uh, compound is. This is very similar. We vary two external parameters and we calculate the optimal growth rate, which is, you know, the function that we are after. And what we're going to see, and we already see it from the curves I had earlier, there are discrete number of solutions and you get phases. You, you predict discrete number of phenotypic states as a function of extrinsic variables, which uh, are the uh, environmental conditions. So the idea is shown here. Um, Further to the left is a graph we just looked at before, where we're calculating the growth rate as a function of oxygen. But we can also consider, so, so those calculations are done at a fixed substrate optic rate. But we can also do the opposite. We can fix the oxygen optic rate, <coughs> and we can vary the substrate optic rate, which in this case will succinate, as I recall. Um, or we can do them both at the same time and generate that three-dimensional diagram shown in the middle. So the, the uh, two graphs on the sides are just slices through that three-dimensional uh, diagram. And that three-dimensional diagram, uh, this is a polytope, and this is simply a projection of the uh, high-dimensional solution space into these three dimensions. So what is shown in that three-dimensional uh, diagram is the growth rate on the z-axis now, which is the, the objective function we are after. And on the x and y-axis are two environmental variables, in this case, uh, the substrate and the oxygen availability, or more generally speaking, the carbon source and the uh, um, electron acceptor. So in the COBRA toolbox, <coughs> you can calculate these uh, uh, diagrams uh, directly. And what is shown in this diagram also is a red line, the center diagram, which is one edge of that polytope. And that turns out to be <clears throat> the optimal yield you get. So if you fix the substrate optic rate, you can predict that optimal yield. And we'll see that in a moment. <clears throat> so here are some of the characteristics of this phenotypic phase plane, PHPP. <clears throat> it looks like this. And this is the floor in that three-dimensional diagram. If you just put the edges of the polytope down, project them down into the plane in the floor. You get these lines that are shown here. And you get what I was talking about earlier. You, you get the regions in there um, which denote a particular metabolic state. If you cross any one of those lines, 
you predict a shift in the metabolic state. So in the panel uh, to the left, there is a, 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 a simple face plane shown where there's a line of optimality going up at a roughly 40 degree angle and two phenotypes on each side of that and then outside of those phenotypes there is no solution. You can't always get a solution for all values of the inputs. And this is a very simple um, phase plan and we'll see in a moment that this is actually for growth on acetate. What is shown on the, on the right is an interpretation of that diagram. So we have a shadow price like uh, I mentioned before. You vary one parameter, it's the slope of that curve. But you can calculate the shadow prices for all points in that plane for both of the compounds that are on the two axes. And you can ratio them, and that is uh, indicated at the bottom with this parameter alpha. And it turns out the parameter alpha predicts the characteristics of these, of these phases. So one of the, in one of the phases there on the left, we have completely vertical lines. That means that one of the shadow prices is zero, but the other one has a value. So that corresponds to a single substrate limitation. The other input is it, lim is it limiting. Then in the phases in between, when, that, uh, when the uh, uh, slope of a constant alpha value is negative, these are phases of dual substrate limitation. So one goes up and the other one down, they balance each other out. And the slopes can be different in the different phases. And then finally, we have lines in there. These are called isoclines of constant alpha values. If they are positive, you uh, predict that to be phenotypically unstable, as we'll talk about in a moment, um, like the force feeding of oxygen before. If you put a model in that uh, part of the diagram, you get a better solution if you were to throttle down the optic rate of A and until you hit that line that demarks uh, uh, the boundary between two phases. Okay, so that's, um, <clears throat> that's how the phase, uh, phenotypic phase plane works. And this has been used for a number of studies, as we'll show you in a moment. So here is the phenotypic phase plane for acetate. This is a growth of the uh, MG1655 strain on acetate. And acetate octa grade is on the x-axis, and you can calibrate that by simply by the concentration of acetate. So you can control the octa grade of, uh, of acetate. And uh, the oxygen octagrade on the y-axis, you measure. And you would predict it to be such that you're on that line of optimality, which is in red. And the uh, data points tend to fall on that line. So this E. coli strain you know, grows optimally on acetate. The three-dimensional rendering of that is shown uh, to the right, where the uh, growth rate is plotted above the plane, uh, shown in panel A. And now you have another output, which is actually the growth rate, and now you have three data points, the acetate optic rate, the oxygen optic rate, and the growth rate. And they tend to fall exactly on that edge of the polytope where the optimal solutions are. So this is interesting. Um, I will talk more about this, actually, when we start talking about uh, laboratory adaptive evolutions. So the features of the phase planes are as follows, the phenotypic phase planes. There are infeasible regions where you can't get the fluxes to balance, and I mentioned that before. You cannot always get a solution for any arbitrary value of the inputs. You can um, see the regions where growth is limited by a single uh, optic rate, one of the two optic rates uh, represented on the axes. You can identify regions where, where there is a dual uh, substrate uh, limitations. And you can um, uh, predict these futile regions or phenotypically unstable regions if you have uh, alpha values of greater than uh, zero. Alpha um, is the uh, ratio of the shadow prices, and if the, the slope of that isoplan is positive, you uh, are predicted to be in um, uh, a phenotypically unstable region. So the isoclines are really just slices through that three-dimensional cone at a constant z, so a constant growth rate, and you just project that down. So an isocline is a line in the plane that where growth rate is a constant. Just like an isotherm it shows up in a PVT diagram, you can trace out the conditions of the constant temperature. And you find these lines of optimality uh, that corresponds uh, uh, to the optimal biomass yield uh, or the growth rate, depending on how the problem is formulated. 
Okay, so let's see how some of these look, uh, what these look like. So here's the ATP phase plane that we looked at before. We had here uh, an octagrade of glucose of one, and we just uh, increased stepwise the oxygen uh, uh, availability until we hit six, and that's the maximum ATP yield of 17 and a half, uh, and then it drops to zero after that. You can't balance it. Now we can repeat this calculation for any value uh, of the uh, glucose octagrade, and this red line I just put down there corresponds to one, glucose rate of one, and that's what's shown over here. Uh, and you can repeat this calculation over and over again <clears throat> in a computer, just you know, change the uh, 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 oxygen octagrade. And now you see these three uh, faces <clears throat> that we talked about before form <clears throat> segments uh, in that plane uh, of the two octagrades. So there are three distinct faces in here. And if you pick uh, points in any one of them, you get a metabolic state that corresponds to these three faces shown in the graph on the left. That the red region, or kind of dark burgundy, I guess, um, that's when you are past that optimum and you can't find any solution. So that's a region that's infeasible. So that's how we can calculate an ATP uh, yield uh, phase plane. So we can calculate some of these. Let me just walk through uh, some of them. So here is what you can calculate uh, with, the, with the core model, not the full model, genome scale model as I had before. The phase plane for growth on acetate, and it basically looks the same. You have a big infeasible region, two phenotypic states uh, <clears throat> that are separated by this line of optimality, which is this, uh, the edge on that uh, simple polytope there. You can look at the same phase plane for <clears throat> excuse me, uh, growth on glucose, and there it is. And if you look at the floor of that diagram, you see now the three faces. <clears throat> there is the line of optimality that's in there, shown here. And the kind of bright green region next to it are uh, all the optic uh, rates, or combination of optic rates that would predict acetate secretion. And below that, uh, uh, light orange color, that's acetate and formate. Then if you go further down to the darker orange color, that's where three byproducts are predicted to be uh, secreted, acetate, formate, and ethanol. So the um, um, graphs I showed you before just fixed the glucose octagrate in this plane and calculated the line vertically through that by changing the oxygen availability. That's when we mapped out these three phases. So these straight lines we had in that original uh, robustness diagram now becomes a big swath uh, in the phenotypic phase plane. <clears throat> as shown here. Okay, some genome scale calculations. <clears throat> this is actually the first uh, uh, phase plane that was uh, printed. This is for Haemophilus influenza with the carbon source on the x-axis and the nitrogen source on the x-axis. And then you can just look at the metabolic states in each one of those phases and you can interpret them. So the uh, triangular shape close to the y-axis would be carbon limitation, and that triangular uh, shape close to the y uh, x-axis uh, would be nitrogen limitation. So those are the uh, best use of the network when you're limited for carbon or nitrogen. The other three uh, phases in, be, uh, in between are either energy lim limitation or different types of redox limitation. So this is something you read out uh, the shadow price structure of the solution. Here is uh, another historical example. This was an early <coughs> set of experiments that gave genome scale models quite a bit of credibility, uh, or credibility uh, 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 gave them, uh, uh, well, made people interested in them because they could actually predict something useful phenotypically. So this is the malate optic rate uh, on the x-axis here, uh, and oxygen optic rate on the x-axis. And there's the line of optimality in red, and you see most of the data points fall on that line. And the growth rate is added uh, in the three-dimensional um, um, image to the uh, uh, right. And the points kind of fall on that edge uh, in, the, uh, in that solution space. There's a little red arrow in the face plane that, that says zero to 40 or something like a 30. Those actually, uh, indicates an adaptive evolution on malate, where it started out on that line and just moved up that line to higher and higher growth rate. 
Here is the same thing for another TCA cycle intermediate succinate. Similar results. We have the faceplate to the bottom right, uh, left, excuse me, uh, the three dimensional figure there on top. And you see in this case, the, the points lie on that line of optimality until it hits oxygen optic rate of about 20, which is the maximum oxygen optic rate measured by the strain. And then it veers off that line of optimality and goes on to, into that phase two, where it takes up more succinate than it can fully burn. And you can see it also on the uh, face plane on top. They, they appear on that surface. And then the model predicts an overflow metabolism into acetate. It takes up more carbon than it needs, burns as much as it has oxygen for, and the rest of it is secreted as acetate. And the panel to the bottom right shows calculated and measured uh, acetate secretion rates that uh, are largely in agreement. So this is a prediction of an even more complicated phenotypic state, not just full um, aerobic growth on, um, on a substrate, but on a, a substrate where you take up more than you need and you burn um, the balance, the excess, uh, uh, through a fermentation pathway uh, through a metabolite overflow. And we'll talk uh, more about uh, metabolite overflows uh, later in the class. Okay, so here is another one, another example. It's kind of interesting. This is growth of yeast. So the, um, um, to the bottom uh, left, we have the face plane itself. And this is glucose optic rate and oxygen optic rate. And in here, there are two lines of optimality. The red, the red one is a little steeper, is full oxidative growth. And the uh, red line is a little leaner, is the uh, uh, micro uh, aerobic growth where ethanol is being secreted. And, and it turns out that ethanol is the preferred substrate to be secreted by uh, yeast if oxygen is limiting. And that was a, a prediction of the uh, original uh, genome scale model for yeast. It does not like to secrete acetate like E. coli does. It secretes ethanol, uh, fortunately, I guess, from, from, from some points of view. But anyway, so there are three different measured uh, uh, states in this, in this uh, uh, face plane that are sh shown here. There are two uh, uh, growth uh, conditions on these red lines and one there in the middle uh, that is uh, a, a, a mixture of oxidative and fermentative uh, growth. <coughs> Finally, you can actually draw um, phenotypic face plane for communities. <coughs> this is a recent paper that uh, calculates the optimal growth rate for a community, not a single strain, uh, as a function of the uh, uh, growth conditions, what's available to the cell. These are cells that um, uh, exchange electron equivalents by, <coughs> by, um, uh, by direct uh, <coughs> uh, interspecies electron uh, transfer, something called diet. Um, and in this case, you can actually calculate the optimal composition of the community as a function of the uh, environmental conditions uh, it is in. And in this case, there is a line of optimality there and just one point on it. <laughs> so maybe not a comprehensive assessment, but at least at one point it is on the line. All right, so we'll summarize here. Um, <clears throat> we can um, take any parameter that we like in a genome scale model or a small scale model and just vary it continuously and repeat the uh, um, optimization calculation for every fixed value of that parameter and we can trace out curves uh, like I've been showing. Uh, when we change one such parameter, <coughs> we um, call it robustness analysis. When we're looking at two of them simultaneously, it's called the phenotypic phase plane analysis for the reasons that I explained. and. Um, many, many uh, optimal growth properties uh, of cells and conditions, uh, different conditions, have been productively analyzed uh, using these methods. So that's the uh, end of the lecture. <clears throat>